Yeah, so I'd like to thank the organizers for bringing this together. It seems like a really nice, a really nice thing. Um, so let's see. I'd like to start with a couple kind of basic questions, a little bit vague. Um, first question is, what kinds of structural theorems are possible for finitely generated semigroups of finite endomorphisms of quasi-projective varieties? Um, say a little bit more about what I mean uh, by structural theorem later on. Um, I sort of want to pin this down a little bit by saying, what might these structural theorems say about pre-periodic points? So in other words, uh, what information about pre-periodic points of uh, elements of a semigroup of finite endomorphisms, what can they say about the structure of the semigroup? Um, I'll start with a really, really simple example. Let's say that I have uh, two maps, Pn to Pn, okay? Each with degree greater than one, and let's say they commute, okay? Uh, then they have the same pre-periodic locus. Okay, uh, that's that's pretty easy to see. You can get it from from Northcott, for example. Um, so you know, if, if G has finitely many pre-periodic points defined over K and they commute, then F is going to shuffle those around. So they're going to have to be pre-periodic for F too, and vice versa. So basically, what happens here is a very simple finiteness result means that if you commute, each morphism shuffles around the pre-periodic points of the other one, and since there's finitely many over uh, over various field extensions, right, uh, you will get, uh, it'll ha those will have to be pre-periodic as well. Um, so in particular, right, an abelian semigroup, let's say of rational functions of degree greater than one, all the elements will have the same exact set of pre-periodic points. Okay, so how much, uh, so commuting implies same set of pre-periodic points. The proof, as I said, is, is quite simple. When your degree is greater than one, uh, it's true in more a lot more generality, which I'll get to later, but it's not true in complete generality. Uh, very silly example, but it illustrates something that I'll get to later. Um, if I take, say, f of x equals x cubed and g of x equals minus x, then obviously f and g commute. But uh, clearly, right, uh, everything is pre-periodic for g. G is torsion, right? Uh, Whereas uh, not everything is pre-periodic for F, so clearly the pre-periodic locus is not the same. Okay, so you need a little bit more. So in a lot of well, you could there's an easy fix for this that I'll get to later, um, but it's not quite exactly true if you use this sort of naive notion of of which of what you mean by pre-periodic points. Um, so there's something actually a lot more general than that than that commuting statement, which is the following. Um, if I take an endomorphism of Pn of degree greater than one, um, to state my theorem, I want to do a little bit of notation that might look funny to you. Um, we're going to be, right, so we're going to be composing maps of degree greater than one, right? So we're not in a group. These things don't have inverses. We're just in a semigroup. So I'm going to use the notation uh, generating, you know, left angle, blah, blah, right angle to mean the semigroup generated by A not the group generated by A and B, because there is no group generated. Okay. So I'm going to use this to state my theorem. This is due to uh, Jason Bell, Kipping Huang, Wayne Peng, and me. Um, let's say I just take two maps, Pn to Pn. Let's say they each have degree greater than one. If the pre-periodic locus is not the same, then there is an L such that F to the L comma G to the L is the free semigroup on two generators. Okay. So in other words, if I raise F and G up to a high enough power, there's no connection at all between those powers. Uh, this means there's no non-equivalent words, W1 and W2, NFL and G to the L, such that that are equal to each other as morphisms. Okay, So there's literally no relations at all of any kind between F to the L and G to the L. Of course, if they com if F and G commuted, right, there'd be millions of relations because the word F to the L, G to the L is not equivalent, right, to the word G to the L, F to the L, but they're the same map. Okay. So uh, this is quite a lot more general. Um, I'll say maybe a tiny bit more about this later, but uh, one thing we don't actually know yet, uh, if we need this L at all, maybe it's true that F, G itself is just free. We don't have any counterexamples to that at all. Um, and in fact, for polynomials, you can often show this is true. With it. Um, so the proof of this is actually pretty simple. Um, once you once you set up your height functions correctly. So what you do is this. Uh, we have, I'm gonna be a little bit vague about what I mean by height functions for now, because it's gonna turn out you actually have a lot of flexibility in choosing your height functions. They don't have to be day heights in particular. Um, 
So we have good canonical heights attached to my f and g, and they're just given by the usual Tate limiting procedure, okay? Um, where d is the degree of f, and I can do the same thing for g. Okay. So like if this is a ve height, you can do this, but it, you can also do this for Morawaki heights as well. And I don't really know, for all I know, there's other functions out there with some of the same properties as height functions. Uh, you know, maybe not all the properties, but uh, where, you can, where you can do this. So what do I really need for this canonical height? There's a really crucial thing that I need, which is this right here. Um, if the pre-periodic points are not the same, then the heights are not the same, okay? Now, where does this come from exactly, right? This comes from the fact that, um, that the pre-periodic point, if, if I choose my height function wisely enough, okay, it will vanish at exactly the pre-periodic points and nowhere else, okay? So uh, the pre-periodic locus will be exactly the place for each of them where the canonical height, this canonical height is zero. So in other words, a zero canonical height basically picks out the pre-periodic points. So if the pre-periodic points are not the same, then the height functions are not equal to each other. Um, now, we can use this trick. It's, this is very simple. Uh, what I'll do is this. I'll start with some word W1 and W2 in, F, in FG. i sorry, I think I should, yeah, take any words like this, okay? Um, if the word, if my first word, okay, my W1, F to the L, okay, if I take a word that starts with F to the L, it can be anything after that. Not anything just an F to the L and G to the L, but even just an F and G. Take a word like this. I can attach sort of what you might call like a normalized height attached to it, right? Where I take a point Z, I hit it with a word, and then I divide by the degree of the word. Turns out that if L is large, that will be almost exactly the same thing as the canonical height. And it's very easy to prove this, again, using the Tate limiting procedure. And then I can do the same thing for any word that begins with G to the L. So, so this is any word in F, so it's a little bit, in the end what I get is freeness of F to the L comma G to the L, but I'll, what I actually have here is a little bit stronger in a way, because it's actually telling you something where the words, the W1, the W2, they're just words in F and G. And I do the same thing here, okay? And this thing here for any Z will be about the canonical height of Z, and this thing here will be, so this thing here will be about the height, of the F canonical height of Z. This thing here will be about the G in all the um, But those aren't equal to each other. So if these two things aren't equal to each other, these words cannot be equal to each other as maps, right? Because if they were the same map, they'd give the same height. If they were the same map, they'd have the same degree. They do the same thing to the points. The height would obviously have to come out the same, okay? Um, that means that this W1 F to the L is not equal to W2 G to the L. Um, and so then using some sort of, uh, there's a little bit of, so morphisms in general, the right, they're not really cancellative, but you can cancel stuff off from the right-hand side because they're surjective. Okay. So once you have this, you can play a little game with induction and you'll get that F to the L comma G to the L is free. In other words, there's no word in F, there's no two, there's no non-equivalent words in F to the L and G to the L that are equal to each other as, as maps. Um, so let me say a little bit more here. Um, this works, it doesn't really have to be P to the N, P to the N, okay? Uh, it would work exactly the same uh, for any polarizable map. As long as I have good canonical heights, it can work. It might work even more generally. There might even be some situations where you have something that captures enough good properties of a canonical height that you can use the same argument, okay? So I don't really use really, for example, we don't really use anywhere in a proof that this canonical height is, is similar to a they height or a Morawaki height or anything like that. We really just use this formal, these sort of formal properties about what happens when you iterate. And that's really good. Um, the height could be a they height or a Morawaki height. Those are the two that we use. Um, one really crucial thing I should mention here is that uh, because we have only two maps, F and G, right? We're automatically defined over a finitely generated field. Right? Um, so we do have some height, we do have these height functions we can attach for that reason, okay? Uh, this wouldn't work quite the same if I tried to do, so you could try to do this for three maps, four maps, five, you could do various things where I added more maps in. Um, mostly things work the same, 
Crucially though, it has to be a finite set of maps because I do have to have a finitely generated field that I'm working on to get these to get these um, height functions. Um, maybe, so yeah, one thing we're curious about is can you always just do this without leaking the floor? So either F and G generate a free semi-group on two elements or the or the pre-periodic locus is equal to each other. Um, so we can prove a nice converse for rational functions in dimension one in characteristic zero. Okay. Uh, in some cases, we can treat some non-characteristic zero cases, but in general, to get something really nice, we have to be rational functions in dimension one uh, of in over a field of characteristically zero. We have a converse for this. If the pre-periodic locus is the same, then they don't contain a three. We can say a little bit more than that as well. Um, I will say there's no nice converse in general though, at least if I consider all polarizable maps. It's possible the converse is true for maps PN to PN, but if I look at more general polarizable maps, there's lots of counterexamples. Probably the easiest one is you take an abelian variety with quaternion multiplication, okay? Um, so then all the endomorphisms, right, will have the same, all, all the group endomorphisms, right, will have the same pre-periodic locus, i.e. the torsion points, right? Um, but if you just look at the quaternions as a ring, uh, under multiplication, it does contain free, it does contain free semigroups. That seems a little bit strange, but it's not that hard to contain a free semigroup generally. To contain it, to, con to take two elements that don't have any relation between them, when I just take positive powers of them, it's generally not that difficult to do. So I think this works with a, a one plus i and one plus j or something like that. The group that one plus i, one plus j generates is not a free group on two elements. The semigroup that it generates really is just the free semigroup on two elements. Okay. Um, so you really cannot expect a converse of this in general, although there is a nice one dimension. Um, I'll say a little bit more about heights. Uh, so with Vey heights over function fields, right, there's a problem. There could, it could be, right? Uh, it may not be true that only the pre-periodic points have to have height zero. Um, now, uh, in characteristic P, if you choose your initial, ve if you choose your Vey height uh, to have field of constants that's finite, it is true. Um, so you can handle any characteristic P case this way. Uh, characteristic zero, trying to use Vey heights gets a lot more complicated. There's a lot of nice uh, papers of uh, Rob Benedetto and um, Matt Baker handle it in uh, dimension in dimension one. There's work of Chatsudakis Rushovsky in higher dimension. There's work of Gautier Zini in higher dimension. Barney, probably others. It's really there's a lot of really interesting questions about these about canonical heights attached to day heights in higher dimension. Um, turns out we don't need them because we can just use more Milwaukee heights in characteristics of zero. It turns out they have the same form. They have a complicated definition, but they have the same formal properties. That Bay heights do, and from those formal properties, we can derive. Like, as I said, we're using very, very little about heights in our theorem. Just a few formal properties drives everything. Basically, you need to know that uh, they vanish, that, that you end up, that the Tate limiting procedure works, okay? Uh, and that what you end up with is a function that only vanishes on pre periodic points. That's it. Okay, so here's a more general question. Is it true that for any finite morphisms, X to X, okay, X here, let's say quasi-projective variety. I don't really know exactly what conditions we need to put on this, but let's say quasi-projective variety for now. Uh, that the semigroup F and G generates contains a free semigroup on two generators as long as the pre-periodic locus is not the same. Uh, so the answer is no, uh, we can't, that's not true in general. Okay. Um, we actually already saw an example, right? And when we did f of x equals x cubed, okay, and uh, g of x equals minus x, not every pre-periodic point in g is pre-periodic for f. Um, now, it's pretty easy to modify the question to avoid this kind of counterexample. I'm going to use what I call isolated pre-periodic points, right? So let's notice that with g of x equals minus x, what's really the problem? The problem is that everything is pre-periodic for, for my x goes to minus x. So you're not going to be able to say anything that great about the pre-periodic points when it's just all of P1. Um, 
So what we do is we use isolated ones, and it's the sort of the natural definition here. Uh, we start with a map, x to x. You define uh, what I'll call prep m n of f to be all the x such that f to the m plus n of x is equal to f to the n. So, um, that'll be Zariski closed. Right? Now notice, I'm not saying this is so. This is a this is maybe a slightly funny definition. It's tempting to look at this and say that the period is m or something like that, but that doesn't have to be the case. The period could divide m. Okay. Uh, the pre-period doesn't really have to be exactly n either. It could be less than n. Okay. Um, so this m and n, they're not for an x, they're not the exact period and pre-period at all. Okay. They're just uh, they're related to it, okay, but they're not exactly that. Um, so this is risky closed, right? So since it's risky closed, I, I, I can look at its components, right? I'm working in some quasi-projective variety, so I can look at the components. Um, so we'll define the isolated pre-periodic points to be the elements of the of prep of F that are not in a positive dimensional component of prep MN of F. So I, isolated is a, right, just to be a little careful about the definition, it's isolated relative to other points with the property that f, f to the n plus n of x equal f to the n plus. It's not isolated with respect to all pre-periodic points because very typically, right, the all pre-periodic points will be Zariski dense. So if I took the Zariski closure of all the pre-periodic points, I'd get everything in it. So the, so the isolation is relative to other pre-periodic points that meet this condition. It's it's not, it's not, they're not isolated relative to all pre-periodic points. Okay. Um, a little bit about the notation. Why do I call it star star? So originally when um, Jason and Kepping and I were working on this, we actually had another notion of isolated that's um, a little bit different. Where I take MN, I I I want to just not be in a positive dimensional locus of prep N M prep MN of F, where M and N are minimal for my x, uh, but it turns out that doesn't work quite right. So you need this sort of limiting notion, of, uh, you need a somewhat limiting notion of isolated to make it work. So we have this other notion that I think is actually more natural, um, harder to say, but I think more natural that was prep star, uh, but most of the things we wanted to prove we needed to be in this prep double star. Uh, let's just think back on our earlier example. When f of x equals minus x, prep star star of f is actually empty. There's no, it doesn't have any isolated, it doesn't have any isolated pre-periodic points, even though everything is a point of period two. Um, and I can do the same thing with periodic points as well. So the theorems I state will actually be for periodic points uh, for, for uh, automorphisms. Okay. Um, we can't prove that much uh, along the lines of what I'd like for general maps. So we'll talk about period as well. And it'll be the same thing. Same definitions. So here's a much better way of phrasing my gen our general question. I have two finite morphisms, x to x. Probably we want x to be quasi-projective variety, but maybe it's true more generally for schemes with some property. You do need f and g to be finite. I'll say a little bit more about that later. Um, everything fails in essentially the most spectacular possible way uh, if f and g are not finite. Okay, literally everything fails. Um, is it true that if I take these two finite maps, x to x, that the semigroup they generate contains a free semigroup on two generators? <coughs> Whenever x has an isolated pre-periodic point that is not a pre-periodic point for g. So it is so so if we went back to minus x and, and x cubed, right? This is true in fact. Um, because one of the maps has no pre-periodic points, right? Uh, that are isolated. The other one, all its pre-periodic points are pre-periodic for the minus x because minus x has everything as a pre-periodic point. So this gets around the examples quite natural. <coughs> um, I want to say a little bit about, uh, I want to say a tiny bit about the, um, what the free semi-group on two generators is going to look like. So. Back when I did PN to PN, the semi-group had the form F to the L generated by F to the L, G to the L. <clears throat> can you always do something like that? Can you, so can you, could you not only say you've got a free semi-group, 
the two generators, but here's the generators. The answer is actually no, kind of a cool example, very simple. Let's say I take S to be generated by uh, a two T and T squared. Okay. So obviously these do satisfy some relation, right? T squared, uh, two T, this, and that'll be true no matter what I raise two T to. No matter what I raise two T to and what I raise T squared to, I'll always have a relation kind of like this one. So, right, so what is this relation? Let's call these F and G, right? This is F, G equals F, F. Sorry, this is going to be G, F equals F, F, G. Okay, and no matter what I rate, no matter what I take, power I take to T2 and what power I take T squared to, I'll get some kind of relation like this. But, oops, sorry. S does contain two T squared comma T squared, which actually is free. This doesn't look like it should be free, but it is uh, because uniqueness of two attic expansion. So you you know you can look at your word. Basically, it'll give you a two attic expansion of your of your of your of your um, of your coefficient. Okay. Um, so we can give a bit of an answer to question six in the case of linear groups, uh, turns out. So the following we can prove in a pretty, pretty bare hands manner. Um, this is Bell, uh, Kepeng, and me. Let's say I take a finitely uh, generated group of automorphisms of variety X, no condition on field or, def uh, field or anything like that. If G is virtually nilpotent, then for any G1 and G2, the isolated of G1, the isolated periodics of G1 are periodic for G2. Um, I should say what virtually nilpotent means. It means it contains a nilpotent subgroup of finite events. <laughs> uh, so if I combine this with work of Tietz, Rosenblatt, Agnitsky, and Sabo, we can get the following. Let G1 and G2 be elements of the same linear group. <laughs> If there is uh, X and per star G1 is not periodic for G2, then the semigroup they generate contains a free semigroup on two elements. Okay. Sort of basically just, just what we want. Um, so how do we prove this? Um, uh, most of it is in this theorem A, and then we use some sort of powerful stuff um, that comes from combining the Keats alternative with some work of Rosenblatt, Kachninsky, and Sawa on three semigroups and solvable groups. Okay, so let me say a little bit of what this what this is when you piece it all together. This is stated in a paper of Kachninsky and Sawa. If I take a finally generated semigroup in a linear group, one of the following holds: either S contains a non-cyclic free semigroup, or the group S generates is virtually. Okay, so either the group they generate is virtually nilpotent, or you contain a free non-abelian semigroup. Um, so the really heavy power theorem on this, the really deep, deep theorem that drives this, is something called the Keats alternative. Okay, so the Keats alternative says that any finitely generated linear group uh, either contains a non-cyclic free group or is virtually solvable. And this teeth alternative was sort of the inspiration for all the questions that we're asking here. I want to say a little bit here, and I'll come back to this again, is that having a non-cyclic free group is very, very different from having a non-cyclic free semigroup. It's very, very easy to have a non-cyclic free semigroup. It's much harder to have non-cyclic free groups. Okay. So um, the way this really works then is teeth breaks it down. If you, if you have a free group, you obviously have a free semigroup. Otherwise, you're solvable. And then there's a whole line of theorems on solvable groups. Okay. I will say this to one, one slightly funny thing is that uh, I had hoped that when I looked at Akinsky Solva, what they actually proved is that this is that if I take any solvable group, okay, one of these two things holds, but they don't actually prove that. It's only this, this really is specific to solvable linear groups. Um, yeah, so here's some other groups for which the Tietz alternative is known. Tietz alternative is either you're virtually solvable or you contain a non-cyclic free group, um, the Cremona group, some really, really beautiful work of um, uh, Kantak, Favre, uh, and Lamy uh, proving this. Uh, the group of automorphisms of any projective variety and characteristic zero is another example. So it's a Kiem, uh, Aguiso, and Chang. 
<laughs> yeah, so I want to really emphasize one thing here. It's much, much, much easier to contain a non-cyclic free semigroup than to contain a non-cyclic free group. So uh, any virtually solvable group, sorry, I, I said this wrong, any virtually solvable linear group that is not virtually no potent contains a non-cyclic free semigroup. So lots of things contain. Oh, sorry, the way I said this is, no, sorry, the way I said this is correct here. So any virtually solvable group that is not virtually nilpotent contains a non uh, What I actually want for the, what we actually wanted on the last page was a tiny, tiny bit stronger because we wanted it, we wanted our free semigroup to be in this particular semigroup. Um, now here's something else quite interesting. There, this, this, everything fails pretty much completely <laughs> in the worst possible manner. If you stop having your semigroups consist only of invertible maps. Okay. If I allow myself to take matrices, you can do this with three by three matrices with integer coefficients. If I allow some of my matrices to be non-invertible, everything fails completely. Okay. Um, there's non-cancellative linear semigroups, meaning that not everything's invertible, of what's called intermediate growth. Uh, so you this uh, so it turns out say a little bit about growth at the end the notion of growth in a group and the sort of the two obvious cases of what can happen one of them is called is a virtually no potent case in that case you have what's called polynomial growth the number of words grows very slowly on the other hand on the other side you have something called exponential growth you automatically have exponential growth anytime you contain a free uh, non a free non abelian semigroup. But you could also have it without having it. Um, so just with very simple three by three matrices, integer coefficients, um, they actually have examples of things that are basic, completely, you know, com a complete failure of any kind of principle. That's what we're suggesting here. So at the beginning, when I started to ask these questions for finite uh, morphisms, finite is really, really crucial. Things like this just won't work if you're not. Obviously, for the linear map, right? Uh, you're either finite. If you're finite, you're not a morphism, right? If you're not finite, then you have an infinite kernel. <laughs> okay, so I want to, so I want to talk about one other interesting structural theorem uh, called the Borel fixed point theorem. <laughs> so the Borel fixed point theorem, um, it's the following. It's really quite nice and easy to state. Take a connected, solvable, affine algebraic group acting on a projective variety over an algebraically closed field. Then, uh, if you're solvable, right, there's an X. It's a fixed point for everything in G. So this generalizes the result, basically saying the same thing uh, for linear groups, saying that they have a common eigenvalue. Basically, if you're solvable, a uh, common eigenvector. So this is sort of generalizing having a common eigenvector. Uh, really, really beautiful proof. If, if you haven't seen it before, it's it's very easy to describe. Um, you use induction on the length of the Dirac series for G, right? You you take commutators over and over again, and you eventually reach the identity. Okay. Um, so, right when I take when I take the commutator, right, that'll have a that'll have a shorter Dirac series, right? Um, so you take uh, you pass the GG and you use induction, right? So uh, There'll be something that where GG fixes everything, right? You'll take that Y where, uh, where, where GG acts trivially. It's easy to see that that'll be closed. So Y will be a projective variety in its own right and GG acts trivially. Okay. Um, now the isotropy groups G, Y, G acting on Y are normal in G basically because G my GG is abelian. It follows quite easily from that. <laughs> um, now, there's a Y in GY that's closed in Y. That follows pretty uh, pretty simple application of Chevrolet's theorem. Um, the GY will have that, that if I look at GY, it'll have to be uh, it'll have to be constructible. Okay, you can get that there's some. So it doesn't mean not all GY will be closed, but there'll be some that some that are closed. And you can it's really just Chevrolet uh, plus induction on the dimension. Okay. Now it turns out this isn't too hard to show either. But if I take a um, if I take an affine group G, okay, affine algebraic group, and I mod out by a normal subgroup, GY, 
what I get will still be F, right? Um, so GY, which is isomorphic to G minus GY, will be F. Okay, because GY is zero. Um, and it's closed, right? Because GY is closed. Uh, so if you're affine and closed in a projective uh, variety, you're a point for GY. So it's a really, really, so it's a really, really elegant uh, group. So uh, what we wondered is how much can you generalize this? Like, uh, for example, trying to do this for any finitely generated um, group is is more general, right? Because um, any any uh, alpha and algebraic group will contain some finally generated group that's that's risky dense in it. Okay, and obviously uh, being a fixed point will remain right when you pass to the risky closure. So you might say, uh, can, you, can you do something like this for finally generated groups? <laughs> Secondly, you can ask them, um, what if the variety is not projective? So if the variety is not projective, it's quite easy to see. There's no guarantee that you'll get a couple of fixed points. You can just delete all the points. And what you'll have will be quasi projective. Um, yeah. So what do we get here? So here's something that we can prove. Uh, now here it's only characteristic zero. So here we take any finitely generated solvable group of automorphisms of the variety X defined over a field of characteristic zero. Suppose that every element of G has an has at least one uh, isolated uh, periodic point. Then there's a subgroup H. A finite index in G uh, that fixes every, that there's a subgroup H. Sorry, uh, there's an X and a subgroup H that uh, that fixes X. Well, so it's so H. I have a I have a subgroup of finite index with a common fix. Um, the proof of this is quite similar to the Borel fixed point here. Um, the key fact is really this: we do the same trick. We pass over, okay, to the uh, to the commutator group, and then we use induction. Um, what we do is this: we show that if I have an isolated periodic point, just for any element of it, just so this, so I have an X that's isolated for some H, okay, not for every H, but for some H, and an and is periodic for everything. Okay, then X will actually be periodic for everything. So it's a subtle lift property here. It has to be isolated for something in the commutator and periodic for everything, but not necessarily isolated for other things in the commutator. Um, then when I go up to G, it'll stay periodic for everything. G. Um, so the way that this art is really similar to sort of the inductive argument in the Borel fixed point theorem, there it uses something about closed orbits. Um, what we do here instead is um, we basically, whoops, we basically look at the orbit of this X and show that it's, and show that it's uh, finite for every element of G. Um, so how do we do that? What we end up using is a sort of a Burnside type theorem for group actions, along with a, uh, a really general version of North. Okay. So uh, the following, so the, you know, the, there's the, the famous Burnside problem for groups, right? Is that if it asks, is a finitely generated torsion group necessarily finite? And the answer is no. Uh, there were examples about maybe 50 years after Burnside posed the question. So we have sort of a similar, you can ask a sort of similar question for group actions. So let's say I take a quasi-projective variety over a field of characteristic zero. Let G be a finally generated group of automorphisms of X. <laughs> okay. If X is periodic for all G and G, then the orbit is finite. So it's sort of like um, so it's sort of like this, right? With the Burnside problem for groups, you have the group acting on it. You have the group acting on itself, right? Um, and uh, all the toward everything being torsion is sort of analogous to this this periodicity result. Okay. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is saying if you're finally generated for a group action, um, and something is periodic for everything in G, then it's worth it. So in other words, its orbit is finite under any every every single element of G means that it's actually finite for all of G. Um, this ends up being a pretty simple application of the Bell Poonin arc law. You start with you take your X, okay, take any X that you want, actually, periodic or not. Um, 
there is a P and a subgroup H of G of finite index, such that for every H and H, you have a p-adic analytic map, theta H, uh, from ZP to Q of P, such that theta H of N is just H of N. That's the arc lemma. Um, if, sorry, I think I knew, yes. If N, if X is periodic under H, then it's gotta be fixed by H. Uh, and so we have this finite index thing where anything that's periodic is fixed. Okay, since that's finite index, it acts trivially on the periodic point. Uh, and so that gives you a finite order. <laughs> the other thing we use is a version of Northcott for integral points. Um, so with the usual, the usual Northcott theorem on finiteness of, inter, uh, sorry, finiteness of, of pre-periodic points, it's not known over finitely generated fields, but for integral points, we really do have it. Um, so I start with the n characteristic zero. So let's take a variety over a finally generated field k of characteristic zero. And let's let x be a model for x over a finally generated ring the field of fractions k. And let's let f x to x be a finite morphism that extends to a morphism on the top. Then there are finitely many isolated pre-periodic points that extend to integral points. Okay. Um, this turns out not to be really very difficult to prove. Um, there's a really, really nice paper of Fockrudens where he bounds the possible periods of our integral points. Okay. Uh, and then you can get a bound in the pre-periods using a nice argument of scanlets. Uh, so while Northcott's theorem for pre-periodic points is not known really at all over finally generated fields, it's a relatively easy, and it's fairly precise too. You can, you can write down a relatively precise bound on the possible periods. Um, Crucially here, the, the, the argument about the pre-periods, the characteristic doesn't matter at all, um, but the Fockrudin argument on bounding the, uh, the Fockrudin argument on bounding the um, periods, it's very crucial that you accomplish the zero. Okay, so I think what I might do is end up, uh, I'll pose some just kind of general questions about generalizing some of these. So uh, would it be nice to have a truly general Northcott theorem? So let's say I take a finite morphism for X, quasi projective variety, over K, and let's say that K is finitely generated. Uh, is it true that the isolated points, uh, isolated preperiodic points, there's finitely many of them in F? Uh, I haven't, yeah, I don't, I don't really know of any results along these lines at all that are, there's a, I, there's a few, there's a few cases, right? So, I mean, obviously this is true if you're polarizable. The question is, is it still true if you're not polarizable? You do need to be, you do need to be finite probably, and you also do need um, to do this for isolated, right? If you take the non-isolated, there's tons and tons and tons of characters. What do we get this for? We only get this for integral pre-periodic points, and even then only in characteristic P. So it's not known in characteristic P or for rational points. Um, I asked a few people, I sort of thought, well, is there maybe some obvious counterexample in characteristic P? I talked to Dragos Gioka and a few other people about it, and there's not any obvious, well, I mean, if there is a really obvious counterexample in characteristic P, but no, no one seemed to know what it is. So uh, I think that's, yeah, I think it's a very, very natural question that I don't know the answer to. Um, here's another thing, and this, uh, let us be a finally generated semi-group of finite morphisms from X to itself. Suppose that X is pre-periodic under every element of S. Is it true that the orbit of X under S must be finite? So when do, so when can, what can we prove this for? We can prove it when you're in a group in characteristic zero using the arc lemma. <laughs> Can't prove it at all in characteristic P because there's no arc lemma. Uh, in characteristic zero, there is a slightly weaker version, okay, of the arc lemma uh, that applies. It's sort of an almost arc lemma that Jason Bell came up with. And it seems that it may actually be enough. Uh, you may be able to use that to prove that this is true if X is actually periodic under every element. It seems to possibly work for that. Um, but handling pre-periodic points seems much, much harder. So 
again, this one I really, this one I really suspect is true. Like, uh, I'd be surprised if there was a cover. Okay, so finally the last one, I'll need a little bit of terminology to really uh, do this one here. But, um, so uh, I talked a little bit earlier about uh, rates of growth, which probably many of you have seen before. So the rate of growth of a finally generated semigroup is measured by the number of words of length at most n uh, in some finite uh, set of generators graphs, right? And this, this is, you might have only seen this before for groups. It's actually, I think it's a slightly more gen natural definition in a way over semigroups because you don't have to consider inverses. You're really just taking, taking words. Um, so the growth is said to be poly, it's said to be polynomially bounded if this number is bounded by a polynomial in n. Uh, so you haven't seen this before, sort of intuitively, what's something that would clearly give you polynomially bounded growth? Abelian, for example, right? It's very it's very easy to count the number of words in n generators if they commute with each other, right? You can you can check that it's you can easily check that it's a polynomial in n plus one. <laughs> it's said to be exponential if it grows at least as quickly as e to the n. Um, so if you were free, it's very very easy to see that it grows that it grows like that it grows like e to the n, at, le at least as fast as e to the n. Um, so there was an open question for a long time: Are there any groups that have, and are there any groups or semi groups that have growth that's faster than polynomial but slower than exponential? Uh, Gregorchuk found groups of, of, of growth that are in between. Uh, it's a, if you haven't seen it before, it's an extremely, extremely simple example. Um, it can be described in a couple pages. It comes from a group action on a binary rooted tree. It's not, a, it's not really a very complicated example. Proving that the group that you get has this weird intermediate group is, growth is hard, but describing the group is, is really surprisingly, surprisingly easy. Um, I might say one more thing doesn't really necessarily come up in what we've been doing, but really, really beautiful proof of Gromov is that a group has polynomially bounded growth if and only if it's virtually nilpotent. Uh, if and only if it has a nilpotent subgroup of finite inputs. Really, really big uh, result of Gromov. So it doesn't really come into what we're doing. Here, but it's, it, if you think of this, the, some of the things we were talking about earlier with virtually, with virtually uh, nilpotent, it's virtually no points a very important condition. Okay. All right, so uh, yeah, so here's the question that I think I'll end with here. Uh, are there any examples of finitely generated semigroups of finite self maps of PN having intermediate growth? Uh, or are there any semigroups of finite self maps of anything, maybe scheme, quasi projective variety, whatever, having intermediate growth? Uh, we'll be very interested to know the answers to this. So I think I will end a little early since I didn't get any questions during the talk.